Toronto, Ontario. The fall of 2009. Taylor Mitchell is a rising star. Only 19 and a year out of high school, she's been making a name for herself on the Canadian folk music scene. Some of the country's most respected musical icons are starting to take notice. Gordon Lightfoot sat there and he said, I've traveled a lot in the Arctic and when I listen to her voice, to me it sounds like an Arctic stream, clear and cool. And I thought, coming from Gordon Lightfoot, that's high praise. She knew what she wanted in life, and I think once she decided that she wanted to be a singer-songwriter, her life took off in that direction. As Taylor's success grows, so does her audience. Hanging out on Toronto's Talent, I'm joined with Taylor Mitchell. You uh, brought your guitar, and uh, tell us what you're going to be playing for us today. It's a song about um, coming to a point in your life, and you don't really know how you got there, and uh, trying to figure out how to find your way back on the road. I was born beneath a small key line. You couldn't face me if you tried. I've got a broken father. Following the release of her first album in the spring of 2009, she begins a solo tour of Eastern Canada to support her album. October 28th, she's scheduled to play a show on Cape Breton, a large, sparsely populated island off the coast of mainland Nova Scotia. Taylor arrives two days early. With time on her hands, she plans a hike in one of the island's most gorgeous spots, Cape Breton Highlands National Park. The park lies on 93,000 hectares, with dozens of hiking trails snaking through lush river valleys and dense forests. One of the most popular is the Skyline Trail. It loops gently to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and back. Some walk the Skyline for its mild slope and beautiful views. Others come hoping to see wild animals up close in their natural habitats. An avid nature lover, Taylor is probably intrigued by the possibility of encountering wildlife. But she's also here for some solitude and fresh air after the hustle and bustle of the tour. At around 2.30 p.m., Taylor leaves the parking lot, heading up an access road that leads to a clearing where the trail begins. About 15 minutes later, she passes a couple heading in the opposite direction. We hiked all the way out to the headlands, and about halfway back to the parking lot, we met a lone hiker, um, a young teenage girl. This is the last time anyone sees Taylor Mitchell safe and sound. A short time later, the couple think they hear loud cries in the distance, but can't tell if they're human or animal. They rush to the parking lot and call 911 from an emergency phone. At 
3.15 p.m., dispatch alerts Constable Pierre Rompre of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The complainant advised that she heard scream, didn't know if it was animals or human. At that point, I knew there was something wrong. You don't scream like that on the Skyline Trail. And I asked immediately dispatch uh, an ambulance to the scene. Then, Rompre heads out to the Skyline Trail himself. At about the same time, a group of four young hikers pulls into the parking lot. The couple tell them they think they may have heard screams or howls on the trail. Undeterred, or maybe even intrigued, the hikers head up the road. Minutes later, they come across the first signs that all is not well. Halfway, we found some keys sort of just on the trail. And we didn't really think too much of it. And just before the clearing, maybe, maybe 50 meters before the clearing, uh, we found a camera. We thought it was kind of weird. Like we started sort of, I don't know, realizing things weren't quite right at that stage. And then we started sort of yelling out just to see if anyone was around. We yelled out a few times, and then um, after a few times, we got sort of a cry back. Yeah. The hikers quicken their pace to the clearing at the end of the access road. We sort of saw through the trees before we got to the corner. We saw blood and like sort of clothing with blood on it. And we were sort of all a bit taken back, like what is going on here? There was like a small little toilet and it had like blood just below the handle. It was crazy, it was like out of a horror film kind of thing. There was, I definitely thought it was sort of some sort of murder and there was some crazy axe murderer guy there. Like it was just, it was kind of, it was bizarre. We then went around the corner. Uh, what we saw was a girl just off the clearing in sort of just in the woods. The girl is Taylor Mitchell. Her body is riddled with bites. She has massive wounds to her left leg and head and is barely conscious. Standing over her, a single coyote. It made eye contact with us and just stood over as if it wasn't going anywhere, as if it was sort of protecting its meal, I guess. Us three guys, we kind of ran out of it to scare it away. I'm just finding anything we can find just that could be sort of used as a weapon. It didn't back away at all. It almost sort of, I don't know, put up some resistance to us. I don't know too much about coyotes, but I would think sort of three guys running at one coyote, it would scare it away pretty easily, but that wasn't the case at all. Eventually, the hikers are able to get the animal to withdraw by charging and throwing sticks. But it never moves more than 10 meters from the injured woman. We went over to her and she was conscious the whole time that I was talking to her. And she said she was, um, Taylor, she said she was 19 and she was from Toronto. I didn't really get too much more out of her. Um, because I think she was finding it hard to communicate at that stage. Five minutes later, Constable Pierre Rompre arrives at the scene. He finds the hikers, signs of a violent struggle, and Taylor Mitchell on the ground. A few minutes later, the paramedics arrive and carry Taylor to the ambulance. Her injuries are unimaginable. Her condition so critical it takes both paramedics to treat her. Rompre is forced to drive. At 4.20, the ambulance pulls in to Sacred Heart Health Center in Shetty Camp. Taylor has lost a lot of blood, but doctors manage to stabilize her vital signs. At 
6.30 p.m., a chopper arrives to airlift Taylor to Halifax's QE2 hospital. The flight takes a little over an hour. She had extensive puncture wounds and scratches basically from head to toe. She arrived with us about four hours, I understand, after the initial attack and, uh, and by then had lost a lot of blood and, and was quite unstable. By 11 p.m., Taylor has received several blood transfusions. Doctors labor for four hours to save the young woman's life. But at 10 minutes past midnight, Taylor Mitchell dies. Uh, we just weren't able to, to uh, overcome the, the massive blood loss she, she sustained prior to arrival. The entire incident happened in less than nine hours. A promising young life cut short. A completely unexpected fatality in a place where more than 200,000 visitors walk safely each year. The facts suggest that Taylor's death is the result of a coyote attack. But if so, it's unprecedented. The first recorded case of an adult killed by a coyote. A creature known to avoid humans, not attack them. With no witnesses to the actual attack, investigators will have their hands full trying to unravel what happened. What led to the tragic death of Taylor Mitchell? The attack on Taylor Mitchell is a wake-up call, all the more terrifying because no one saw it coming. As word travels far beyond the remote communities of Cape Breton, experts in coyote behavior start hearing about the case. Twenty-six hundred kilometers away, Dr. Stanley Garrett learns of it almost immediately. This is right down there. A wildlife ecologist at The Ohio State University, Stan has been radio collaring and tracking coyotes for the last ten years. The first notice I ever got about this incident, I remember it very well, uh, it was actually in the middle of the night. I started receiving calls from the Canadian media that there had been an attack. And an attack on a, on a woman, but many of the details, of course, weren't uh, available. So at that point, I didn't understand the severity of it at all, and I don't think anyone really did. Stan is a recognized expert on coyotes, but his field research isn't done in the wild. His subjects are right here, in and around the big city. He's right in front of us. Well, I arrived in Chicago back in 1994, and uh, I began to study urban wildlife at that time. Um, little did I know when I began that work that I would eventually be studying coyotes and maybe more. Be careful where you step. Chris, during the 1990s, the number of coyotes continued to increase and I was beginning to receive a lot of questions about how do coyotes work in this area? Um, are they something that we should be afraid of? And unfortunately, I didn't have any good advice for them. Over the last decade, Stan's research has taught him a lot about how coyotes share living spaces with people. Six for the tail. Hundreds, maybe thousands of coyotes now thrive in Chicago. There you go. Good job. All right. A densely populated urban center should be an incubator for interspecies conflict. But there has never been a coyote attack on a person here. Not one. For Stan, that makes the fatal attack in Cape Breton all the more astonishing. It turns on its head everything he thinks he knows about coyotes. When I heard that it was it was fatal i was in shock i really didn't expect that it was a uh, an adult 
that was healthy and, and vigorous and, and everything, and that's not what we would normally expect for a fatal attack. In fact, the incident seems so unusual, Stan doesn't quite believe what he's heard. So he heads up to Cape Breton to investigate for himself. Back in the communities surrounding the National Park, residents are reeling from the news of Taylor's death. Longtime Cape Breton resident Jim Mustard is county councilor for the town of Inverness. Jim knows the attack has changed the people who live near the park. They no longer go out without giving forethought. They no longer think of even doing things like uh, taking a trip somewhere without contemplating the idea of maybe it's too far to go from the car to where you're going. That's changed. Now, whether that is irrational or not, that's what's happened. We'll probably never be the same. I suspect we'll never be the same. For the Cape Bretoners who live near the Skyline Trail, Taylor's death is not only shocking, it's bizarre. The attack seems completely out of character for the normally elusive coyotes. Coyotes have the innate ability to change their habits to suit their environment, often within a single generation. tremendously adaptable animal. They have an extremely diverse diet. They can, anything that's even remotely edible on the landscape, you will find coyotes eating in that particular area. They're capable of living in temperatures, uh, extremes from very hot desert environments to cold Arctic environments and, and everything in between. Um, forested areas, uh, plains areas, prairie areas. Uh, in my mind, there's no other mammal in North America that is so adaptable. So regardless of how you feel about coyotes, you can't help but respect them. Over the years, coyotes have constantly explored new habitats. Today, they live in every American state except Hawaii. When coyotes made it to Cape Breton Island, they found a land of plenty lots of food, and little competition. Where food is involved, coyotes can be ferocious, even toward their own kind. But few have seen that ferocity turned on people. Coyote's typical response to humans is to run away. As Taylor Mitchell set out, she probably didn't give coyotes much thought. She had no way of knowing there was something in those woods to fear. Stan Garrett arrives in Cape Breton. His first step is to walk the route Taylor Mitchell took the day she was killed. He's sure there must be something different about this place, or about the coyotes that live in this park. Uh, there was a lot of speculation as to what might explain this behavior. So some of the ideas have been that we're talking about coyotes that are sick, such as rabies, or unhealthy, maybe emaciated, maybe really old and not able to, to catch their own food. Maybe people had been feeding them, so they had lost their fear of people over the course of uh, time and become increasingly um, aggressive. So there was that theory out there. Stan's starting hypothesis is that given the severity of Taylor's wounds, there must have been multiple coyotes. 
even though Constable Rob Prey and the hikers had seen only one. I would be shocked if that was an attack of only one coyote on that individual. Stan meets park official Eric Muntz at the scene to go over the details of the attack. We think that, that she came from that spot, trying to get shelter into the washroom building here. So we feel as though she made an attempt to get inside the washroom, and there was a sign of a struggle on the, the ground here. But she was un unable to get inside. She was found. Found of her. She was found right here. Laying, was laying in the woods right here. The last time anyone saw Taylor unharmed was at 2.45 p.m. when the couple Mike and Gail passed her on the trail. But sometime shortly after their encounter, for reasons we'll never know, Taylor turned around and headed back the way she had come. At 325, the four hikers found her near the clearing. So the attack must have happened sometime during those 40 minutes. And thanks to Mike and Gail, we also know there were others in the vicinity at that time. About halfway down the access road, um, Mike brought to my attention that he saw two animals coming towards us. I looked up and I saw what appeared to be a German Shepherd. Gail told me that's a coyote, so at that point I pulled my my camera out and I started taking shots. The animal was walking steadily towards us. A second animal came out from behind the first and we were startled by it and I managed to get a, a picture of, of the two of them together. Once we saw it disappear, we started then walking towards where our car was parked. That's when we heard the scream. The timestamp on Mike's photos placed the coyotes on the access road at 302. The couple heard the scream at around 308. If one or both of these animals had been involved, they must have reached Taylor by then. That's a six-minute window from when they were photographed to when the attack began. The coyotes would have walked right into Taylor as she headed back to her car. This is where the attack probably started. It ended just off the clearing, where Taylor was found with a single coyote standing over her. One animal caught in the act, but now, photographic evidence, there were at least two on the trail. Tahun lepas, user guna ubat gigi sensitif biasa kan? Betul. So? Ingat ni? Oh, nyilu. Nyilu sangat tu, tak tahan tu. Lepas tu, kamu bertukar kepada Colgate Sensitive Pro Relief? Memang cepat sekali besar. Sebab ia bertindak pada punca gigi sensitif. Ia membantu membaki gigi untuk kelegaan segera dan perlindungan berpanjang. Lebih daripada setahun. Semenjak guna ni, tak pernah lagi kasi nyilu dah. Tengok ni. Tak ada masalah. Nyilu tak ada langsung. Colgate Sensitive Pro Relief. Kelegaan segera dan perlindungan berpanjangan. Kini juga dengan formula membaki enamel baru. Colgate, jenama nombor satu disyorkan oleh doktor-doktor pergigian di seluruh dunia. Ah, I'm tired. Oh, damp smell. Wish this could smell nice like fabric conditioner. <laughs> Introducing the new Febreze Downy Scent. Wow, I love the new Downy Scent. <laughs> the new Febreze Downy Scent. It is said that to prevent dandruff from coming back, the power is hidden in herbs. For the first time, Clear uses technology to unlock the power of herbs. To prevent recurring dandruff, new Clear Herbal Fusion. Selected herbal essences, 
are infused with advanced anti-dandruff technology, nourishing the scalp deeply to fight and prevent against dandruff. Dandruff doesn't come back. New Clear Herbal Fusion. New Rexona Men. No matter how intense the action, it keeps your underarms dry. New Rexona Men. With 50% more long-lasting protection, so you're always fresh, always confident. Spray on the confidence. Rexona, it won't let you down. Shortly after the attack on Taylor Mitchell, Parks Canada sets out to find and kill the coyote Constable Rompre wounded. Standard practice when a human is killed by a wild animal. But coyotes live in social groups of three or more individuals and quickly learn behaviors from each other. So the wardens have to expand the hunt. Between October 27th and November 14th, they kill a total of six coyotes in the general vicinity of the Skyline Trail, and one a little further away. The animal's remains are sent to a lab on nearby Prince Edward Island. What Stan Garrett discovers here will only deepen the mystery surrounding Taylor's death on the Skyline Trail. Pierre-Yves Daoust is a wildlife pathologist at the University of Prince Edward Island. He believes there is evidence that at least three coyotes were involved in the attack. So were you able to, to find evidence that actually linked these animals to uh, the incident? Definitely one of them could be placed at the scene. Uh, the other ones we could um, quite confidently place at the scene based on the, uh, uh, some of the unique markings on the pelt and also uh, because we did identify ammunition in the carcasses. This male coyote, designated C2, was hit with two kinds of shotgun loads. Since the wardens used different ammunition from Constable Rompre, it's clear that this was the animal Rompre wounded at the scene, the animal that was standing over Taylor. According to some experts, the markings on this male coyote, marked C3, match the markings of the lead animal in Mike's photograph. And this female coyote, designated C1, was linked to the scene by human remains in her stomach. Then in the first animal, indeed, there was a small amount of material in its stomach that was compatible with, with uh, human origin. And I certainly don't want to, uh, do not want to elaborate further on that, but it was good evidence that this particular coyote was, was directly associated with the attack. Together, the necropsy results point to three coyotes at the scene of the attack. Since only one was seen by eyewitnesses, this is a milestone in the Taylor Mitchell investigation. But if these coyotes weren't starving or sick, what could explain the ferocious attack, which was so unlike typical coyote behavior? Taylor herself have done something to spark their aggression. Some wondered whether she had tried to feed them. But no human food was found at the scene or in her clothing. Could she have tried to explore a den? Not likely, because any spring dens for young pups would have been long abandoned by the fall. With no evidence that Taylor had incited the attack, investigators turned their attention back to the three animals. Did all three coyotes belong to the same pack? Or were they members of different families? The answer might help explain what motivated their highly unusual behavior. 
Following the attack, Parks Canada killed seven coyotes in the area where the attack occurred and subsequently sent tissue samples from those animals to our genetics lab here at, at Trent University. We ran analysis to determine uh, the relatedness of those animals. C1, the coyote that had human remains in its stomach, is probably the dominant female of a family group. C2 is the animal the hikers found standing over Taylor, the one Constable Rompre shot but didn't kill. It's unrelated to C1, so it could be her mate. Because C1 and C2 appear to have been together at the scene, but are not related, they're most likely the alpha pair of the pack. According to Dr. Patterson, the alpha pair is often the chief hunting pair, especially during the season Taylor Mitchell was attacked. Summer and, and fall are, are difficult times for, for coyote family groups uh, in that they have growing pups that need food and, and that are still only learning to be able to provide that food for themselves. So it's the breeding pair uh, that's responsible for provisioning most of that food. And, and this is the time of year when they tend to be skinniest if we look at their body condition and they're under the greatest demand to, to provide the most amount of food for, for those growing pups. So C1 and C2 in this case, uh, you know, we're likely doing most of the the hunting and feeding for a larger number of animals. The consensus of investigators is that C3 is either the son or the sibling of C1, and probably the lead animal in the photograph taken near the scene. And C1 is most likely the second animal in the photo. If these three coyotes made up a hunting party, the motive for the attack becomes clear. One of the most disturbing, unique features of this case is that uh, this was a, clearly a predatory attack, and um, these coyotes viewed Taylor as prey. I am absolutely confident that this was a predatory event. Uh, these coyotes um, attacked this person as an act of predation. It is that clear, there, and there's no doubt. The motive for the coyote's attack on Taylor Mitchell is finally becoming clear. It wasn't self-defense, defense of offspring, or defense of territory. Taylor was being hunted, and by a species thought to shy away from human contact. Either coyote behavior is changing before our eyes, or there is something unique about these animals or the context of the attack. This time, the clue comes not from DNA or carcasses, but from the animal's body language and eyes. Everyone who saw the coyotes describes them the same way. The hiker, Josh Taylor, tells of a coyote that was almost impossible to scare away. I don't know too much about coyotes, but I would think sort of three guys running at one coyote, it would scare it away pretty easily, but that wasn't the case at all. When Constable Rompre arrived on the scene, he too was astonished by the coyote's brazen behavior. He'd never seen anything like it. When I first encountered coyotes, uh, aside from that incident, they don't look at you. They, they look down and then they go back or they go around. They don't try to make human contact. Yet the coyote looked right at me, looked right into my eyes, basically saying I'm not back. Mike and Gail, who saw the two coyotes just before the attack, agree. These animals had an attitude. Usually when an animal sees humans, they want to run away. And this one animal kept coming towards us. 
This lead guy never took his eyes off us and just kept walking at a nice, steady, slow gait. It was really weird. The fact that the animals came so close says something in itself. First of all, it would be extremely unusual to have an opportunity to take a picture like this unless you had a very strong telephoto lens and, and great camera equipment. So the very fact that this picture was taken with, with a typical point-and-shoot camera indicates that these coyotes were fearless and, and not scared of people. Secondly, the coyote in the foreground uh, is looking right at the photographer and is not backing away. And this indicates, again, no fear of people and a dominant status uh, being held by this particular coyote. This is the next piece of the puzzle. Taylor encountered animals that, contrary to what even experts expected, were simply not intimidated by her. Usually when we um, see coyotes that act that bold, in which they really don't care or they're, that someone's on the trail, or even if they're ignoring someone, is that we assume that that's an animal that's habituated. In other words, it's, it's encountered people m many times before, and uh, they've learned not to be afraid of them. It's something Stan expects in populated areas, where humans and animals live in close proximity. But ironically, a protected animal sanctuary like a national park can breed habituation and fearlessness as well. In the Cape Breton Park, hunting and trapping are strictly forbidden. The animals rarely, if ever, experience hostility from humans. In the summer, thousands of hikers walk the trails, many of them inexperienced in the ways of wild animals. And by their very nature, coyotes are always pushing the envelope. They're, they're constantly testing. They're seeing what they can get away with. We also have trails that are, um, they're, the vegetation is very dense, and we cut holes through these, this, this dense vegetation, and the coyotes use these trails. We know that they follow our, the paths of least resistance, and they're following where we walk. So we're, we're creating uh, places where there can be uh, just natural uh, interaction between coyotes and, and people. When Taylor Mitchell walked onto the Skyline Trail that afternoon, she was entering a park where years of habituation may have eroded the coyote's natural fear of people. The fear that usually keeps us safe when we walk in the wild. But even habituation can't fully explain the severity of the attack. There is one last factor that must be taken into account. Something difficult for the untrained eye to see that may have turned an already proficient hunter into something even more deadly. Coyotes have been called one of the most successful predators on Earth. They're smart, learn fast, and can change their tactics in the blink of an eye. Because they're so adaptable and so curious, they're constantly pushing at the boundaries of their territory, looking for new places to call home. Over the past hundred years, coyotes have dramatically expanded their range. The earliest European settlers found them mainly on North America's central plains. But by the early 1900s, they were spreading out in all directions and changing as they went. As coyotes were expanding to the north and east, uh, specifically when they passed through southern Ontario, they came into contact with our remnant population of eastern wolves and they actually interbred. And all the coyotes that went on to colonize the northeastern United States and, and eastern Canada carried with them some, some wolf DNA that they picked up here in southern Ontario. This interbreeding between coyotes and wolves created a new kind of coyote, a hybrid called the eastern coyote. All Cape Breton coyotes, including the ones that attack Taylor Mitchell, are eastern. Their DNA contains both coyote genes and wolves. 
As a result, they're generally larger than western coyotes. So we have in front of us here the body of a, a large adult male eastern coyote that we just pulled out of our freezers. We know this animal is an eastern coyote, not only because of its relatively large body size, but more specifically because of the features of the skull. If you look at the head on this animal, you can see a relatively massive uh, wide skull with a fairly thick muzzle. And this is a much heavier bone structure than you would ever see on a typical western coyote. Not only are they usually bigger than their western cousins, eastern coyotes also seem more likely to take larger prey. And they might be less intimidated by another animal's size. But just as important, some experts think the eastern coyotes may also use more wolf-like hunting techniques. Although western coyotes can take down big prey, they generally favor smaller animals, like mice and voles, and tend to hunt alone or in groups of two. Eastern coyotes, on the other hand, seem more likely to hunt cooperatively, a method generally characteristic of wolves. Their wolf DNA may help explain why the three coyotes Taylor encountered weren't discouraged by her size and very likely attacked her as a coordinated team. It was a tactic they had probably used before. Investigators have uncovered a number of reasons why a group of coyotes chased and killed a young woman in the Cape Breton forest. What sealed Taylor Mitchell's fate, however, may have been an act of pure instinct, one she found impossible to control. Confronted by predators, the most basic impulse is to turn and flee. One I gathered from the scene made me believe as she was running, she was taking off the or throwing at the coyotes what she had on her. The set of keys, the camera, and then there was blood, and then uh, the body was right uh, beside the washroom. In the terrifying heat of the moment, it would have been the most natural thing in the world for Taylor to run. But when any animal, even a full-grown human, runs in the presence of a predator, it sets off the predator's instinct to attack. We don't know at what point during the attack she began to run, whether it was before or after the coyotes made physical contact with her, but it is likely that in fleeing from the coyotes, she, she may have elicited a stronger predatory response. In the end, this is the investigator's best guess at what happened on the Skyline Trail. Taylor Mitchell encountered coyotes that knew how to take down large prey as a group, animals that had probably lost their fear of people. Two of the coyotes may have been the alpha members of a pack that had many mouths to feed, and Taylor may have triggered their attack by turning to flee. Her instinct to run sparked their instinct to attack. But even with so many questions answered, Stan Garrett still finds the attack hard to swallow. I still have a hard time equating those animals that were on that trail that's, that are in that picture with the animals that I study. I mean, I know they're the same species, but I just never would have thought, even on a predatory event, that it would, it would be of that kind of nature. But that's bizarre, just totally bizarre. had taken a different path, Taylor Mitchell would be known for her music, not as the first adult on record to be killed by coyotes.
In the wake of Taylor's death, Emily Mitchell is keeping her daughter's memory alive by celebrating her love of music and nature. She's established a trust to promote wildlife preservation and to fund school programs that foster creative expression. She wouldn't want people to be afraid because this happened to her. People have to understand when you go into a park that um, it's, it's a protected park, but it's protected for the wildlife. It's not protected for people. And I think that sometimes we forget that. And, and Taylor knew that. And you have to have some respect for that. It would be easy to think of Taylor's death as a blip on the radar. A tragedy that happened far away to someone else. But that would be a mistake. Because whether we see them or not, coyotes have moved into our neighborhoods. They're in our cities and suburbs, attracted by human refuse and a large supply of rodents to eat. And their numbers are growing. So far, in the last 50 years, only 142 coyote attacks have been reported in the U.S. and Canada. But that could change in a heartbeat. Because coyotes can change in a heartbeat. If Taylor Mitchell's death is to have any lasting meaning, it will lie in our attempts to understand these remarkably adaptable animals and to find ways to coexist. It's a matter of urgency, because today, we all live in coyote country.